We, I tell you why we started is because uh, London Weekend Television had just started as a company, and the head of programmes of London Weekend Television thought that he, he wanted to have a, a better style of comedy, didn't he? He wanted to. They chose us. And, <laughs> And fortunately, the, uh, the audience, uh, well, our television viewers, um, weren't that keen on very sophisticated middle-class comedy. And I said to Frank, I think, you know, we ought to do something which appeals to the majority of people and not just to a few. And so he said, well, I've got this script here. It's been rejected by the BBC. What do you think of this? The BBC turned it down because they said there was no fun in buses. Yes, that was Michael Mill. Yeah, he says it's a very bad script and no more level. It wouldn't be very successful. So we read it and we thought this is a. We think it's just the sort of show we need to do in London Weekend Television, and uh, and we set about casting it, didn't we? Available and had been in the rag trade, uh, and very successful he was too. He was looking for a, uh, a new vehicle, he was very keen, and both were honest thought that was, he was the man for the job, so that was the star. Having got the star, we needed mum. I approached various actresses, and the first actress I approached was uh, Doris Hare, because uh, Rich liked her, I liked her, and we thought she would be ideal. Uh, so I went to see her, she lived by Putney Bridge, and said, Doris, will you come and be uh, Mama in on the buses and told all about it. And she said, yeah, I'll just do it, but she, uh, my, my husband's, uh, he's, he was a phonologist. That's a doctor who deals with a head someone. And uh, he's in a conference in South America, and I promised to go with him, and so I'm not available. So we couldn't put the show off, because uh, television companies had to have the show when they wanted it, not when you could do it. And so she, so she couldn't do it. So I, I tried various actresses, and in the end I, I asked Cicely Courtney, or Dame Cicely Courtney, as she was then, if she would do it. And she did, as you know, the first series, but she didn't gel with the others. And um, well, my wife told me I should never cast her in the first place. She said she'd never been on the bus, let alone that. <laughs> so, um, and she was a big star in her own right, and it didn't quite, we needed, uh, the thing about all the buses, it was a team show. Everyone helped everyone else, and we couldn't have people who wanted to do their own thing. And Cicely Cornish's idea was to sit around the piano and sing songs, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. She told me, she said, I could do it only if I had a month to do it. A month, and we had to do it in a week. So, 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 no, five, so day, five days, actually. Well, we wrote in five days, but they had one, one week in which to learn it and do it. And yes, well, the turnaround was pretty. But I was very much younger then. So and, uh, anyway, the, then we had to, to cast the, the bus conductors and 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 also the inspector. And I had fortunately been asked by London Weekend Television to do a show called Mrs. Wilson's Diary. It had run successfully in the West End for some time. It was based on the uh, private eye who ran this sort of fight, a, a sort of diary every week, and they made a, t a stage show of it. And in the cast there were these two actors, Bob Grant. And, and Stephen Lewis. Stephen, uh, funnily enough, played in the inspector looking after Harold Wilson in the story of, of uh, Mrs. Wilson's diary. And he, I thought he's a great actor. And Bob Grant, with his great big teeth, he, he played uh, uh, George Brown, that's right. Remember the, well, those of you who are old enough will remember George Brown. He was a drunken uh, home secretary, no, uh, foreign secretary, wasn't he, at the time? He was quite notorious, but anyway, Bob was very amusing playing this character. So I suggested to the Ronnies had a look at these two, and they agreed with me that they were right for those two. Uh, Michael Robbins, sadly not, uh, he's no longer with us now. Um, I had worked with him at the BBC when I was uh, producing at the BBC, and, and I thought he was quite talented. He had a lugubrious look, which I thought would be ideally suited. But I was stumped when it came to Olive. And uh, so I said to the Ronnie, said, who can you have, I, I, I don't know a girl who's sort of plain and fat. And... So I think, I think the story of, of casting of Olive is quite amusing, I think Ronnie will tell you that. Yeah, we were working for the BBC at the time, and Anna Karen 
was playing a tiny little bit part, and she came in rehearsal. She obviously had many breakfast, she was hardly made, she hadn't made up anything. And we said, oh, she might just well play Ollie. So uh, we said, her, I told our director, do you mind if we take her to London again? She said, no, no, it's okay. So she got in the car, and I was driving her, suddenly saw she was making herself up in the mirror. So I said, no, no, no makeup. And, uh, so when we got there, a little bit Jew said to her, it's a very un unpleasant part. You're the side of, side of sort of woman who, when she goes to bed at night, uh, takes her teeth out and puts them in a glass, you see. So Anne said, oh, I could do that, and she probably took her teeth out. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the, on the buses very carefully, you'll see she's got her front teeth, but her side teeth are not there. It gives a rather funny appearance, to say the least. And when you think that she was, with Barbara Windsor, she was a beauty queen in the youth, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she meant that she didn't mind what she looked like on this show. She really didn't mind at all. She was marvelous. She wanted the work. Well, <laughs> they all wanted the work. So did we. <laughs> the the, the uh, another amusing story about Anna. She's not here, so I think I can tell this. Was that when the show uh, became successful after you know the second series and people were watching in their millions, um, she started to start to get a little glamorous. Yes. And uh, she started to slim a bit, and of course this wasn't good. But she was a very sensitive girl, and I found that if I upset her enough at rehearsal and said rather nasty things to her, she'd rush off to the canteen, eat a lot of cream buns, and come back <laughs> with the figure we required. Yes. Very, very so that's the casting for you, that we've gone through all of them. And it was the fact that they worked so well together that I think has ensured that, that the show can, can, continues to be successful today. I think one of the reasons people often ask us, you know, why was the bus is such a success? I mean, it's still a success being shown all the time on the television. And, so and, and there are several reasons. I think one of them is that they're all in uniform. And that classes them. They know exactly, you know, the type of people they are, they're, they're bus driver, conductor. And we found out in Spain, when we were writing it, that in those, I don't know, it may not be the same now, in those days, the expectation of life of a bus driver was five years less than the conductor. Was the conductor was going up and down the stairs, chatting up all the young ladies again, and the other guy was sitting there for three hours driving through the truck. And so he died five years before. That, <laughs> that was a true, truthful thing that we got from the middle so of Any bus drivers here? <laughs> Not right yet. <laughs> 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 uh, the thing is, we went on and on and on, but uh, it, it wasn't necessary a, a big show to start. No, no way. We had some awful notices when it started, yeah. and uh, I think I, I sent Steve some copies of those. I think he put it on the website. You can read what what was said about the show. But it, it took a little time, and I, th I think when we changed the casting of Mum, that was, that was a great boost to the second series of the show. And then it still hadn't actually grabbed a large audience. And then Cyril Bennett, the controller of, of uh, London Weekend Television, had a whole, on a Sunday afternoon, he didn't know what to put on, he thought, shall I try the, this on the buses program? It hasn't done so very well where we've had it in, on a Friday night. So he put it on, around tea time on a Sunday. And to his amazement, and I think a little bit to ours, but we were confident in it, but suddenly, I mean, we knew we had good shows, but we, we had enormous figures. People tuned, were tuning in, the advertisers were getting very excited, trying to book a slot, because obviously, if you're an advertiser, you want to, to pay for your advert in a time when a show is getting a maximum audience. Because, you know, that's, that's what you get your money for. And, the, and, and our advertising department would say, great, we can now charge them more money. Because we can say for, for that money they're getting 50,000 people looking or half a million people looking. And then it went up to two or three million. I mean, this was fantastic. And, uh, and that was the big boost for us. Because then when we came with the third series in the autumn of that year, we really, we, we became number one nationally. Um, and the company had never had a show that was number one. Um, and, this, and in those days, you have to remember, there were very few channels that were not like today, you know. It's very difficult today for a, for a broadcaster to get a very big audience because you can watch 
you've got a choice in 2030, a different television channel, but there was only four there. Okay. So it, uh, it made a big difference. Many, 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 many years ago. We, we, we were both involved in a show called Educating Archie. No, never no. Yes, no. Peter Bruff and Archie and Lewis, and I was still on with her, and Ronnie used to write sketches. Farrell uh, Reed. that's right. And then Eric Sykes, who'd been writing the show, went off to write his own show, and Ronnie and I sat for a bit to together and we wrote the show for her. Bit, and then we suddenly realised that what really should be done was television. So we got together, um, and uh, during the war, uh, Romeo had been in the factory and he knew all about trade unions, and I and my father was in the silk business, the trade and the dress business, so putting all that together, we decided we went to see a factory where girls were making sitting there with uh, sewing machines and so on, and so we wrote a show for the work trade, which was. Uh, quite a big success and so much so that the trade union decided, asked the BBC to take the show off because it made fun of trade unions. Thank God the BBC told them to get lost. And uh, that, that was, I think, how we got to go. Don't you know, it's about it. But from that we wrote another show with a marvellous lady called Thor of Her, which was Meet the Life. And then we got together and we decided, I talked a lot about what made the show a success. And I said, well, things were the uniform. And when you think, for instance, what would Dad's army have been if they had not been all dressed up in uniforms? That's what made it funny, all these old guys dressed up in soldiers. And in, in, on the buses, all these people in uniforms, and you knew their rank. You knew the inspector was that, and the naked driver was there, and so on and so forth. And the, the other thing I think which made on the buses a success, a big success, is it's very few shows, I think you'll find, I can't think of any, where there's one guy who's involved with his, at home, with his horrible sister and his ghastly brother in law, and his mother who won't let him leave her home because he, if he wants a girl home, she would get sick. Yeah, that's right. And then uh, the same guy then goes to work, and he's got his conductor who, say, chats up all the birds, and he's driving around there, and of course he's got an inspector who hates him and keeps saying, I'm hating Blakey. So I think that was one of the reasons, don't you, that the show was a success. It was this guy, and Reg Varney, with all respect to him, who died recently, was brilliant. And he, he managed to do the two parts so well together, one at home and then one back at work. And that's what I think helped make the show a big success. We based it on a truthful thing, which was that in Nottingham, they decided to have lady bus drivers, and all the guys went on strike. They did not lady bus drivers, you know. And if you remember the film, and again, it's very important that what people say is, sounds funny. Uh, when the, the, the men made the bus go down the motorway, and the poor lady driver went half several miles down the motorway, and when she got back to the depot, the passions had been in there for two or three hours, come back, and the lady got out and says, I've been in this bus all that time, and I only wanted to go to Tesco's. No, and she said, I only want to go to the National Bank. It's a wonderful way to say it. They didn't double after. No laughs were dubbed off. We had an audience in the studio. They, they didn't, didn't laugh, they didn't laugh. They didn't, laugh. Know, that was that was it. they didn't laugh. So obviously one had to write a script which had a story in it. It was not just a lot of gags and sketches. Yeah. It was a story. And people the liked it. You know, the characters were good though, wasn't they? The the characters were good. We had trouble very rarely, but the audience laughed quite a lot, hopefully, thank you. But once or twice they laughed so much that they had to stop recording. We were talking about this with uh, Steve from the Stuart this morning. Um, I don't know if you remember, not in the film, but one of the episodes which was called The New Uniforms, where uh, the two, uh, the two uh, the conductor and the bus driver, the inspector called me and said, they're going to try and put some new uniforms, and as you're the most disgustingly dirty two in the thing, we're going to try them on you, and if they work with you, they'll work with anybody. So, but go home and get a tape measure, and measure yourself, so we can have your measurements in the morning. So, stand up the girls home, and at that time, uh, the next morning, they're serving breakfast, and his brother-in-law says, why am I always given less food than not your son? So, his mother does here, said, oh no, no, they're the same, you know, you've got a sausage, you've got a leg, and a bit of bacon, what's wrong? 
his sausage is bigger than mine. And he had a tape measure with him, as you can so they started measuring their sausages. And the audience laughed so much, didn't they? That we had to stop recording. And they laughed at him because he said, my sausage isn't going to get the but your sausage is curved. <laughs> well, we, we had to curtail some of the laughter because we had to do the whole script. We were only given 24 and a half minutes to, re to record one of these shows because the rest of the half hour was the adverts, which were essential, of course, to the company to get their revenue. So I had to produce a show which ran exactly 24 and a half minutes. And I didn't think people at home would appreciate it if, if two minutes of that show was occupied by people laughing in the studio. So we had to strike a happy compromise between an appreciative uh, laughter from the audience and getting the show in the can. Well, they, they, they wanted it, obviously, when they saw the success of, of the television shows, the, the producers of movies thought, let's get in on the, on the act team and, and we should write a movie, didn't they? That's how it happened. Well, we did, we did everything in the movie, in, in the movie that we uh, weren't allowed to do on TV. Yes, well, I did. <laughs> yes, she did put some things in her and had edited out as being not suitable for family entertainment. But you got away with it in the cinema. I won't tell you what they were. There's children present. <laughs> I, I started here in 1966 as an extra on the Saints. Oh, Sir Roger. <laughs> Sir Roger Moore. Uh, I liked it and I thought, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I've done the Champions and I've done other things. And all of a sudden I was doing Star Wars and I was doing, I've done 800 productions. So you've seen me. I've been in your front room. Well, you haven't been there. That's what we don't want you to do. <laughs> but yeah, 800 jobs. But it was a living. And what we've got to do in life is we've got to get a living. The two ones are two. We've got to get a living, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Whichever you know. We're not crooks, or are we? <laughs> <laughs> no, we are. So what you've got to do in life is, all of you, young folks as well, do what you want to do. I, could, I was cutting timber in a, a timber yard in 1966, and someone says to me, do you want to do a day's extra work? I thought, I don't know what that is. He said, I'll show you. You come up here and we've done the Saints. And then I have to join the union and I join the union. And 32 years later, I was still doing it. So, yeah, go and do what you've got to do. I could tell you about timber, cutting a bit of wood, but that wouldn't be a life. <laughs> but um, I've got to work with, who do I get to work with? Oh, oh yeah, right. I mean, can you imagine it's been in about eight hundred different uh, TV? Um, Things, you know. Sir, Alfred, Sir Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock. Got to work with him. Yeah, I've got a website yeah. and I'll tell the story, but it's a long website. It's 32 years. Um, I had cancer five years ago, I was going to die. I thought, no, I don't want to die. So I thought, I'll write my story. And I'm still writing. What's that? That's your website. Oh, is it? Carry on with the car, Olivia. 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 I'll leave it, sorry. Oh, that's yeah. Yeah. But it was like, what do you want to do with your life? Well, have you all done it? You've done it. You're all young. You're young. So um, I decided when I came to London, I was going to, I wrote, I wrote about what I did. And I'm still writing it. And I'm pleased to say it. It's good. No so, wisdom show we did that, did you? No wisdom. Just but if you if you get time to watch, I, I've got some cards here, and I'll give you my website, and you will laugh. I mean, it's a great life, a very privileged life. I work with John Wayne, big John, <laughs> but it was good. But two days with John Wayne, two weeks with Alfred Hitchcock. What do you want to do in life? What do you want to do? I'm sorry. <laughs> Huh? How good an actor was John Wayne? Uh, I worked two days. John Wayne was a good actor because he lasted for 50 years or more. He was a good actor. What would you like to work with? Uh, you don't get to call him John, by the way. Um, the Duke. Um, and if you got introduced him. But it's like all of these people. When I worked on, on the buses, I was an extra. And you fill in the background. And that's what you do. You film in the background. I was a dance, a dance player, was I? A dance talker. Yeah, I think the, hair, the hair was down the back. But they're playing the women dance players. You'll see how in that one. 
So when you're an extra, you're, you're not a, um, you're not an actor. You're a reactor. You react to what people say. When they was having a fight on your <laughs> this on the film, when they was having a fight, I was in the corner out of the way. I didn't even know that. You know, it was me or Olive, and I thought, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that Olive. <laughs> But that's what you do for a living, that's what I do. But it, what a great living, wouldn't it? You read my website, and even if it's a, because I've done Doctor Who's, loads of them Doctor Who's. But it was, it, it was a living, it was, it was going out and getting a living. Wonderful living. I remember working here in the studios, when it was the whole studio, no Tesco's. Uh, great days, the Champions, uh, the Saints, the Avengers. This was a big studio. Yeah. And uh, when we made air films, when we made on the buses films, it was a big studio. I think we filmed um, Stage 5 at, at the back lot, which is now gone. It's well and truly gone. So, um, this was, where you're sitting now, was the workers' canteen. And it cost four bobs to get a lunch. Four bobs. Who remembers four bobs? Yeah, look at it, the old boy there. No, uh, four bob is about 20p. Yeah. But if you want a bit of steak, it costs a five bob, which is 25p. So I mean, it was a bit, I couldn't afford that steak. Uh, but this was, there was our canteen. Where you're sitting now is where the tables and chairs was that we filled with champions and the vendors and was coming in for our lunch. But uh, that was a couple of years ago. So it's, uh, there you go. Good question. Good question, Gordon. I don't know why they did. <laughs> I've waited 40 well, years to answer this. They were all in uniform for a start. That was good. And, I, and then, I, I just don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Just don't know. But we, we, did, we, 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 did, we were obsessed with the idea that they were all in uniform. That was marvellous. I think we played around with the soldiers at one point. I don't know. It was difficult to find, apart from things like that, so I mean, people who were, were worked in uniform. There were not that many places, but it, it was interesting that they were being in uniform and made probably all the difference in my opinion. You know? And uh, I don't know what I thought. Strangely enough, when we, when we started the show, when we started the show, when we started the show, the, the, the monthly red bus people, what they call the London Transport, they thought it would be rubbish and they didn't want to do it. So we had to have, if you remember, in the first turn of the series, we had green buses, Milford, didn't we? From, uh, from uh, uh, Wood Green. Wood Green, yes. green oh, buses, you see. Because the uh, London Transport thought it would be rubbish to have their thing. But when it was a huge success, and then they made a film, they let us use all the red buses and the skip pan and all the things that they <laughs> the red buses. So it just shows you if you want success, it makes a lot of difference. Now, we, I think we were to a certain extent influenced by Dad's army and the success that that had. And then we decided to have people with, that, with uniforms. And what else could we do well, except from buses? Well, you know, give me an idea of what other things we could have with uniforms. But I did a series, what well, they did over Mr. Beeching, that was on the with uh, the railway people, wasn't it? Died a death. I did a series about milkman, and that died a death as well. So the uniforms aren't always the answer. I think they're rather qualities that uh, buses have. You know. I don't know whether the, if it was all had been in black and white, would it have been as big a success as it had been? In, if everything went to colour. That was what it was. Um, the, the ITV were late in getting colour. The BBC got colour first. I did my first colour production for the BBC two years before um, I did a colour production with ITV. Um, and I was very cross because they sent me on a course to learn how to do it. I said, look, I've done it. But, uh, <laughs> but we, 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 it, did, it did cause a bit of difficulty. It cost us more money. Because when it was uh, in black and white, I just, I, when we had to have the bass garage, I just didn't put any scenery up, I just had the studio as it was, because, you know, inside, if you think of a, of a film studio, it looks very much like a bus garage. Uh, and you can't, in, in black and white, it wasn't obvious. When, when we went to colour, the designer said, oh no, I should have to have special walls, I should have big flats, and I should paint 
beautifully. So it did cost a bit more money and caused a little bit more difficulty. But uh, no, I mean, obviously things are better in colour. Um, you can see them in, in, in my television. I mean, in, in, when you think we, we used to do the show on the tiny television sets people had, now you see the show as people never saw it when it was first done. And in, in, in big widescreen televisions, I mean, uh, so it, 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 it obviously tanks the show. I wouldn't say I could tell you that the ratings went up because of colour. It, 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 it was colour because everyone else was colour. We had to compete. I think the new uniforms as well, from this one, it's an answer measuring the sausage, but, because then they met some Swedish girls who thought in their new uniforms that they were, and she said, oh, are you a pilot? Can you fly a young girl yet to New York? And, and um, Stan Butler, who was not very good at words, was about to say no, but Jack said, oh yes, well, we fly the young girl yet. And then so then they went out the girls, and we had some rather naughty gags, because the next morning, uh, Stan Butler said, oh, I, I think I'll be all right with it tonight. And Jack, uh, the inspector, the conductor said, I was all right with the last night. <laughs> but then they, they came to work the next day and the, the um, inspector said, we've decided to do away with these uniforms, actually, so take these things off, go and put your old uniforms. So they did, and then the two Swedish girls arrived to take a bus, and they saw these two guys just off the bus drivers, the bus conductors. And he says, you know the pilot who drives the jumbo yet? And of course the inspector fell about, he says, get, get on, fly off to the <laughs> centre gates. <laughs> at lunchtime, that when I started the show, Reg Varney had had a heart attack <coughs> and uh, he was very concerned about this and asked me if, if, if the rehearsals could be as short as possible so he could rest and he, he, he didn't want to, you know, overexert himself because it's very frightening if you have a heart attack. And so I, I, I did my best to, to make things as easy for him as I could in the rehearsals. Um, in fact, we never rehearsed in the afternoons. Um, there were two reasons for that. One was to, so that um, Reg could, you know, could go home and rest. The second reason was that some of the cast, I said they were all nice people, they did like a drink. Why would you know? They, they did like a drink, and if they got into the bar, when they came back for the afternoon rehearsal, they were much more difficult to direct than they had been in the morning. <laughs> And I thought, this is not working. So I decided I'd send them all home in the afternoon. And we still managed to get the show on. And uh, so that, then they all stuck together very well. We used to have, I remember, lovely parties. We used to, we started the show at the studios at Wembley, which is now the Fountain Studios, where they do the X Factor and many other quite interesting shows. But these studios were the first studios that London Weekend Television had. They were ideally suited to the on the buses, they were great big film studios, and I, they were so, the dock doors were so, the doors that you come into the studio were so big that a double-decker bus could drive in. So we could have real buses, and we could drive the buses around in the studio because the floors were solid, and um, maybe we couldn't damage the floors of these old studios, which had been built for filming, not for television. Um, and we, we used to go, I wrote the, the restaurants we used to go to after the show, we were recording where we always used to have a party after the show uh, to unwind. But, but it, was, it was a jolly family atmosphere we had. Reg didn't come because, again, because he, he took things very easily. But, but the ironic thing, of course, is that Reg has only just died, hasn't he? So from his heart attack, he's, he, he lasted another 40 years, which, uh, which shows that it wasn't quite as serious as he thought it was. But they were all lovely people they, in their different ways, and, um, and they all liked to laugh together. In fact, they got so pally 
but they, but I, on several occasions when I was editing the program and putting the pieces together, um, I had to cut out the wrong name because he, he, instead of calling him Stan, he'd say Reg. I, I, I probably didn't notice it and get him to do it again in front of the audience. And I'd, I'd be editing the program and suddenly I'd find that they call each other their Christian names, not their character names, which was quite embarrassing. In those days, editing anything was really rather difficult because the programs then were edited on, on wide magnetic tape, about two inches wide on these old Ampex machines. And it took a long time to actually do a join. It was because you had to go down the frame lines, you had to look through a magnifying glass and then enlarge the actual frames with, with iron filings. And, and it was a, a, a little before you could stick the bits together. So you can imagine that any, any little edit that was required was very difficult. We didn't do a lot of editing, it was mainly just joining a scene together to the next scene. So we always had a little break between one scene and another to, to get the cameras and the artists in different costumes on over to the next set where they had to do the next scene. But it was all done within an hour, hour wasn't it? The recording time in the studio, the audience would have had an hour to produce the half hour show. One or two reasons. First of all, we were approached about writing a film. So if you remember the last few uh, episodes of Among the Masses were written by other writers. And Rich Barney didn't like that and he walked out of the show and wouldn't do it anymore. So that was the end of the television series. Uh, we, we wrote three films for them, but I mean, uh, uh, who, who, who wrote it? Who wrote it? I can't remember who wrote it. Uh, oh, um, Stephen Lewis and... and uh, Stephen Lewis wrote one. Uh, um, I, I don't know. But anyway, they, they, they didn't quite feature Reg Barnard the way he wanted to be featured, so he walked out to prove them, and that was the end of the series. How many did he 69? I only did 39. You only did 39? Yes. But went on after you But you were missed! You were actually missed. What else can you say about it? Now, I had to leave London Weekend Television and I went to Thames Television where I did a, a show called Love Thy Neighbour. You may have seen that some of you. But uh, I was. Uh, I won't tell you now how why I went. <laughs> we were very strict. We were very strict. I had this maxim which I used in all the shows I did um, to avoid a lot of improvisation from artists. Who, I naturally like to put things in their own words and things. But I used to say that actors act, writers write, and directors direct. And if we all did our job, so whatever the, the writer had written, the actors said. And then and whatever the writer said, or how I wanted it to be done, then I tried to, to direct it in that way, to show it visually in a way that they had imagined it when they were writing it together. And that's, that's how we stayed. Friends, I think. Never, never, allow, <laughs> never allow the actors to go to our direction. Yeah. Never. No. <laughs> we, we kept to our, our various functions, and, and that was very important, I think, again, for the success of the show.